okay, I'll go home then. I'm tired. Hallelujah. I said, how many already forgot to speak to you today? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Um, I, I, I feel happy to be back home. Praise the Lord. We was out ministering the Word of God out in New York on Thursday and on Friday. We came back on Saturday. Praise the Lord. And um, I can tell you that that is a a place that really needs God. New York is a place that um, has really lost their way through religiousness and has lost their way. And they're either too religious or too liberal. They either do whatever they want or everything is, you know, what the rules say. And if the rules don't say it, then it must not be of God. And, you know, they're either living off of old word or they're either living off a of word that God never said. And, um, and, and, and I, I, I'm telling you this because I told my leaders this and um, I hope you don't mind just standing for a couple of minutes. I'm not going to leave you long standing. But I was telling my leaders in the leaders prayer today, I told them that sometimes we pay attention too much at what we don't have and we forget what we do have. And as I was on Facebook um, last night, I always go to Facebook to see if people need prayer requests, see how the church is doing. Post as I, you saw me recording. And I'll tell you why in a second. I was uh, recording videos, posting them on Facebook, on Lifetime, uh, so that people can see what's happening in the church as of right now. We're going to fix Bloody System so that he can do that. When, when, but right now he's not able to, so I can do it off my mobile phone. And on Facebook, for the church that we went, I'm not lying to you. Youth, they're about 14, 15, 16. Nothing like 30 or youth kind of older youth that I have here, Shaq, to testify to and with me. The minister. They are literally getting together to make a road trip to the Chainsville Fort Christian Church. Amen. 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 Woo! Hey! I'm talking about New York with over, I don't know how many millions of people, how many thousands of churches. Listen to me. In New York, there's a church across the street of every church. You go down one block and there are about four churches in one block. And most of them are from the same denomination. There'll be two Baptist churches, two Pentecostal churches, two Methodist churches. There'll be two of everything. Um, and, and the sad thing is that they never even been to each other's temple. Well, that's a preaching for another day. <laughs> but it, it should tell us something about what God has given us in this house. Amen. That a bunch of youth in a city that has millions and millions of people with thousands and thousands of churches are going out of their way to put money together. Some of them don't even have jobs. Some of them are talking about asking mom for money. Let's get the money together to rent a van, get together and come up here and have the LCC experience that we have every week. Yeah. And I tell you that because I, I, I remember last week's service and the service before that and I just am besides myself that there are so many empty chairs on a Sunday. I'm besides myself. Everything is in the Lord's hands. I don't look at numbers. But it, 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 it pains me to know that sometimes people don't know what they have until they lose it. And, 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 and right now, you know, the beach is still... Listen, the water ain't going to disappear tomorrow. The water ain't going to disappear on Saturday. The water ain't going to disappear on Thursday or Wednesday. The movies will be open on that day. Hey, you can see it on the day it open. Movies don't open on Sundays. They usually open on Friday. So... If God has deposited such a glory in this house, and we have a place, then we should be in the glory. How many say it? I, say, I want to be in the glory of God. And, and, and we just, I'll tell you this because, number one, we need to pray for these people so that they can be drawn into the presence of God. And second of all, don't let anything stop you from getting into the house of the Lord. Uh, I, I couldn't wait to get home. Amen? You didn't see how much fun Shaq was having in intercession? Because you don't know how hard of a time he had preaching. Those people were looking at him sideways. They were looking at him like they didn't even know what he was talking about. Oh, but when it was time to lay hands, everybody came out, right, Shaq? We didn't even know there was that many people in the church. Because when he preached, everybody disappeared. But when it's time to lay hands, they came out out of nowhere. We were like, I ain't seen you all day. Where were you? Came out of basements and attics. There was doors, I had secret doors I didn't even see. And they just showed up. Because, you know, everybody wants to be laid hands and everybody wants a word and everybody wants somebody to tell them where they're going and where they've been and, and how, how glory and, and say it on the mic so everybody can know. But nobody wants direction from the Lord. Nobody wants to see what God is telling them with. 
You understand? Everybody wants the bonito fast and ding, 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 ding. But nobody wants to learn how to worship for real. Everybody wants to be emotional, but nobody wants to know how to when the music stop. Still lift up your hands and say, Lord, I praise. Lord, thank you for letting me be in Praise the Lord. So I'm not going to be too long today. I have a word for you. Please pray for me. I've, I've, they've already prayed for me. I thank Harold, Minister Shaq, and my son Danny for praying over me. I'm not feeling too well. Um, I'm trying to hold on and, and allow the Lord. I'm, I, I have a bump that came out on the bottom of my neck. I have some, uh, I don't know what's going on. I feel hot and my whole neck is stiff. Um, but I'm not going to let nothing or nobody stop me from doing it. I can't preach something and not live it. Amen. And, and I've always said to people, you know, I, sometimes people call me. Let me tell you, I'm going to tell you what's the most funniest thing. What's the most funniest thing that, that I've heard in Christian community. Right? This is the funniest thing. And, and you might not think it's funny because you've probably done it. I've done it too. Right? I can't go to church today. Why you can't go to church today? Because I'm sick. Okay. Hold on. Wait a minute. Why are you not going to church? Because I'm sick. Okay. That's like telling me, right? I'm going to McDonald's, right? And you tell me I ain't going to McDonald's. And I ask you why? Because I'm hungry. <laughs> wait a minute. You ain't. I, but wait. But there's food in McDonald's. So if you're hungry, you should come with me. So if you're sick, there's healing in this house. So rather than stay home, that should draw you to the house. Okay. Come on now. <laughs> I just need something, right, that makes sense to you before now. Hey. Let's go to the Word of God. In, let's go to the book of Jeremiah. Amen. Praise the Lord. I'm going to give you the word that God gave me. We're going to go straight to it. And it takes 5 minutes, 15. And we're going to send you on your way for the week. But I want to give you a word that's going to hold on. And, and, and I want to thank you. Let's give glory to God for us. Let's give glory to God for us. Come on, come on, come on. That's okay. Yeah. 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 Um, and I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to tell you why. Praise the Lord. Um, and it's because I know, I mean, again, it's God. It's God's word. There's really nothing we can do about it. But I know that the word has been strong the last two or three weeks. I know it's been strong. I know God has been talking strong and talking direct and... And, it, and some of the stuff, it was we had to, you know, swallow because we couldn't really chew it because it was kind of real heavy. You know what I mean? That food and like, you know that if you chew it, your mouth won't start hurting. So you'd rather take the chance of just swallowing it whole, you know, that steak. So, so I know it was, and I thank the Lord for you because you're still in the house, you're still receiving the word of God, and you're walking, and you and you and you tested the spirits, you you measured it to the word of God. And you're trying to walk in it. So let's give glory to God for that. Amen. Amen. So we're going to read two verses. I want you to go first to Jeremiah uh, chapter 1 verse 5. Um, and then you can put your hand there so that way we can flip it real quick. And we're going to stay right on Jeremiah. And then we're going to go to Jeremiah chapter 20 verse 9. So we're going to do first Jeremiah verse uh, chapter 1 uh, uh, verse 5. And then we're going to do Jeremiah chapter 20 verse 9. So I'm going to ask everybody in the house to stand up for the reverence of the word. Everybody in the house. Amen. Let's be reverent to the word of God. Praise God. If we listen to me, if we stand up in the court when that judge comes in, then we need to stand up for the word of God. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. So chapter 5 is read in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and the people of God. Say amen. It says, before I formed thee, my God. In the belly I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. And I, everybody say ordained. Ordained. Uh, everybody say ordained. Ordained. Thee, a prophet unto the nations. Now come with me to verse, to chapter 20, and we're going to go to verse 9. The Lord. You got it? Praise the Lord. And it says, Then I said, and this is speaking, this is Jeremiah now speaking to God. And he says, Then I said to God, I will not make mention of him. 
nor speak anymore in his name. Ah, but his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing and I could not stay. We're going to preach today under the theme, do I know you? Tell the person next to you and say, excuse me. Excuse me. Tell them, do I know you? Tell the other person on the other side, say, excuse me. Excuse me. Tell them, with all due respect. With all due respect. Do I know you? Do I know you? Come on now, you made me see it. Praise the Lord. So, you know, I just, we just came from New York, you know what I mean? And, 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 you know, sometimes they say, you know, there's a saying that says you can take the man out of the ghetto, but you can't take the ghetto out of the man. Yeah. Praise the Lord. So, so I got a little ghetto that's going on in me a little bit today. So, you know, praise the Lord. Yeah. And, and, you know, when you go to, when you're in New York, you know, it's funny because um, in New York, it's not like out here, you know, um, out here. Uh, when, when 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 you have a child that's doing something they're not supposed to, you know, a person can go up to him and be like, "Listen, you need to stop doing that," you know, or 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 scold them on. But 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 New York is just a little bit too ghetto for that. <laughs> and, and in New York, if you walk up to somebody, right, and let's say you see an altercation or you see somebody doing something they ain't supposed to, and then you walk up to them and and and, and you tell them, "Listen, uh, 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 you, you need to stop doing what you're doing." Because that ain't right. You know what they're going to tell you back? Do I know you? <laughs> Forget about that they're doing something wrong. They're going to tell you, yo, do I know you? <laughs> when we read Jeremiah chapter 1, we begin to see uh, a story and a picture of, of a man about to be revealed and about to understand and get a picture from God himself of who he's supposed to be and who God says he is. How many say amen to that? Because I've always said there are two, the two most important days in people's life, the two most important days in people's life that just, let's just fix the mic. Praise the Lord. Oh, that's good. That's fine. I'll, I'll leave it all off my, off my face. Um, I said that the most important, uh, the two most important days of people's life is number one, the day you were born. Number two, the day that you know the reason why you were born. And in Jeremiah chapter one, you see God telling him, not only telling him that the reason why he was born, but connecting the two things that are most important in his life. Because the first thing that he tells Jeremiah is that when, uh, when you were born, before you were formed in your mom's belly, I knew thee. Shut it off, the button. Trying to get that noise to come off. He told them before you were born, when you were forming in your mom's belly, I knew thee. So, now we begin to see a picture and a a, a, a entrance into, into God. When we read the Word of God, sometimes God, I don't know about you, but sometimes you read the Word of God and God seems a little far, doesn't He? Sometimes you read and He seems so majestic that it almost seems sometimes like you can't reach Him. Especially when you're in a place where you feel you're not looking for God the way you're supposed to. I'm talking to somebody. But you, you're in this place where, you know, I, I want to worship and, and, and I want to, but I don't feel God in front of me. I feel Him above me. And not only do I feel Him above me, I feel a lot of stuff in between me and Him. And I feel like it's going to be real hard, not for Him to come to me, but for me to come to Him. And this picture now begins to show us a heart a picture into the heart of God. And, and the reason I want to speak to you today about this is because I, I feel that um, when God speaks and God gives you a hard message and God tries to, and God gives you a rebuking message, a, a straightening message, a, uh, listen, I want you to be in this direction. I think that many times we allow the enemy to come in and confuse us. 
We allow the enemy to come in and twist the word that God has given us into an offensive word. And try to make us feel, and all of this comes from culture. The enemy uses culture against us. Because most of us come from a minority or Hispanic or an urban culture. And the culture that we come from, you, you need to understand that, now I'm not talking to everybody, but I'm talking to, I'm going to talk to myself then, if I don't want to, you know, because today I'm really going to try not to take it to a place where you have, I offend you. I need you to get this. I need you to get this. So I'm going to do the best I can to deliver it to you the way that you receive it. And when, when we come from a place, and I come from a place, where when I used to be scolded, when my mom used to take the chancla and hit me, <laughs> many times, as a matter of fact, most of the times, it wasn't really to teach me a lesson. Most of the times, it was because she was mad because I was doing something she didn't want me to do. Okay. It was real rare the time, and I can't probably, honestly, I can't remember a time, that she actually hit me and then sat me down and then explained to me why she hit me. I'm talking to somebody. I don't know how many of y'all understand what I'm saying. Because in this generation, it's different. Not only can you not hit, but you got to explain why. You know, you're going to sit them in the corner because then that's verbal abuse. So now you got to explain and give them step by step why is it that I'm sitting you in the chair in the corner because you ain't supposed to hit your brother and you ain't supposed to lie and you did this and you did that. Well, that wasn't my childhood. My childhood was like, I mean, I'm not going to Okay? Yeah. To the point where the chancla, just show the chancla. Remember that? You remember that? Remember that? Oh, and then remember when you used to do something wrong and you get no reaction from your partner? Ooh, no reaction. That's the worst. You did something, right? You broke something, and because there's people around. It's public. Right? And she walks in, and the thing breaks, and you get this. <laughs> I don't know how a woman can stand there so long without blinking. Just, <laughs> and then she'll turn around and act like nothing happened. I was scared. I was like, Mom, just hit me right there, please. Because the anticipation of the whooping was worse than the whooping. The anticipation of the whooping was worse than the whooping. So God shows up to Jeremiah and says, I'm going to give you a picture into my heart and I'm going to talk to you and explain to you how I see you and what I want to do with you. And he tells him and he says, from the belly, if you could pull up the verses, Jeremiah chapter 1, um, and he tells him, from the belly I knew thee, when, when I formed you, I knew ye in the belly. So this now becomes interesting because he's not speaking to Jeremiah in the belly. Hmm. He's speaking to Jeremiah when he is already able to understand right and wrong. He's already at an age. He has passed through his childhood. He has gone through all of it. And now God shows up and tells him, I knew thee and I formed thee in the belly of your mom. Before I formed thee. So not only while he's in the belly, but before he even came into existence. Amen. So he's saying, before your mom knew your mom, your dad, before they even went into this secret place and, 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 and procreated, even before she did the pregnancy test and said, oh, the line is there. I don't know what we're going to do, but we got to do something because we are having a baby. Well, all, even before all of that, God said, I knew you. I knew you. Now, what now? Can I can I take you deeper? Can I take you deeper? Amen. Amen. Can I take you deeper? Because 
I, I, I need to get you to a place where you understand that when God rebukes you, and the reason I was telling you the thing before, is because from the culture that we were growing up with, when mom used to rebuke us, it never felt like she was trying to make us a better person. What it felt like was you just want to make your life better. You just want to, and so, so many of us went into what's called spirit of rebellion. We rebelled against our parents and we said, wait till I get 14, see if you're going to hit me like that. Wait, wait to see. And what we'll happened? Or, you know what, I'm going to just go get me a man and I'm going to get out my house so that that way you can't treat me like that anymore because I'm not in your house anymore. So at 15 and 16, you, you know, we will go and we will get into a relationship and, and move in with somebody and do all this because you ain't going to treat me like that. I'm tired of being treated this way. So I need to talk to you because I feel that there is an attack of an enemy, of the enemy that is trying to get people to a place of thinking that the same relationship you have with your parents is the same way that God is treating you now. That God is simply rebuking you because he just wants to show you the chakla. That God is just simply rebuking you just to show you that I'm God. But he is not simply rebuking you. He is not that type of parent. He is the, the Rogers neighborhood parent. He is the one that when he rebukes you, he is trying to rebuke you because he loves you. That's why before he rebuked you, he wrote in his word and said, The children, the parents that love their children, they shall correct them. In other words, he's telling you, the only reason I correct you is because I love you. But the enemy understands that we've identified with a culture that if we get corrected, it's because you don't love me. Because if you would love me, you would accept me. Okay. So that is why churches that the simple message is God accepts you how you are, stay how you are, get filled with 30,000 people. Because what we, oh God, we identify love with acceptance. Hallelujah. And love and acceptance are not synonymous. They're not synonymous. They're not. Because I can accept you and not love you. Because I'll accept you to use who you are. I'll accept you. You see, if I was a pastor that I didn't love, then I would just use you for your talent. So I would accept you in your condition and let you live however you want. As long as I could suck you dry so that this church can grow. But because I love you, I'd rather rebuke you according to the word of God and correct you. So that that way you can be in a place and understand, wait a minute, he's looking out for my better good. Because above all else, he's trying to push me to heaven. He wants to save my soul. He wants me to be right with God. So before Jeremiah, before God can even reveal to him what he wants him to do, he has to reveal to him who he is. So he tells him, even before you were formed in the belly, I knew thee. That word knew is the same word that when you see in the word of God in the, in the Hebrew, when the Bible talks about two couples knowing each other. Oh, oh. So now what Jesus is not simply saying is that I knew you like you know somebody. Oh, not, it's not simply when you know somebody like, oh, you know that person? Oh, yeah, I used to go to high school with them. Yeah, I know them. No, it's not that no. It's the no that you have with your husband and with your wife. It's that intimacy to the play. So now we're talking about that even before Jeremiah is born, now God is telling him, I already knew you intimately. What he's telling him is that every emotion and everything that was going to be who you are, I already knew who you were. Everything, all your flaws, I already knew it. From the when you fought, and, 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 and this is the other thing that this says. This is the other thing that this says. I knew you so intimate that I know you better than you know yourself. Okay? And why did I do, do that? So that I could be standing in a place where you can't convince me otherwise of what I'm trying to do with you. Because if I know you better than what you are, you can never convince me otherwise. If I know more facts than you know, I don't care how long you try to try to convince me. I'm going to be like, I'm sorry, brother, but I was there. I know better than you. And I know you're trying to change my mind. But I'm telling you, I got more facts than you do. And what God is trying to tell him is, why? Because he knew that the next sentence that Jeremiah was going to say was, but I'm just a child. So he answers his question before even Jeremiah spits out. The, he answers it before Jeremiah spits it out. So in the next he tells him, I'm a child. What does God tell him? Don't say you're a child. Because I knew you from the belly. I knew ye from the belly. I knew ye before the belly. 
the verse then continues and it says, And before thou came forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet. The word ordained means to invest officially, to establish or order by appointment. So God tells Jeremiah, even before you came out, I already made an appointment with you. So, <laughs> before you even knew the word God, I already made an appointment with you. Before, I'm going to take it even further. Before you went through anything that you feel that you went through that supposedly pulled you out of the purpose of God or made you not worthy or made you to a place where God can't use you anymore or where you canceled or forfeited your destiny or your purpose, God already said, I already knew that stuff. I already knew it before. As a matter of fact, I already made the appointment. And as a matter of fact, I made this appointment at this precise time so that you can go through what you went through and still understand that I still called you. I still chose you. I still love you. And I'm still calling you. That's powerful because that puts you in a place where you can't rebuttal God. That puts you in a simple place of choice. You either want it or don't want it. There ain't no excuse. God puts us in a place where we can't look at him and say, well, God, you know, you missed this. No, he didn't miss nothing. He put everything in order and put everything in his place. And made, he ordained, listen, and he's telling him, before, 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 before the womb, before, he says, I ordained thee, I ordained thee a prophet. I made an appointment to make you what I said I was going to make you. I'm simply showing up to you right now just to make it official. Do you understand that what God called you to be, you've been since you were born? Listen, God called you so much and ordained so much, so perfect, what he called you to be, that if right now I gave you one minute to think about all the most horrific things you've ever been through, and I bet you they connect you to your calling. Every pain, every pain, every moment of loneliness, every moment of abuse, everything, no matter what the devil try to do, God will switch it and always make it so that it can move towards your purpose and towards your destiny. Look into your life right now and I guarantee you that everything you do always connects you to your calling but connects you to your past and what you did that was supposed to destroy you just made you more of a prophet, made you more of a worshiper, made you more of a singer, made you more of a leader. But, but my house was poor. How did God use that? Because you had to pull up your leadership skills to say, hold up, we're poor, so we only got a little bit of food. So we got to learn how to divide this thing evenly so that we can survive to tomorrow. And I have to be able to, oh my God, I have to be able to administer the little bit that I have. So you know what? You were a leader from the beginning. You know why? Because when they used to go to school, nobody knew that your children were poor. You, were, you knew you were poor, but nobody knew your children were. You know why? Because you were a leader from the beginning. You was always poor putting things the way they needed to be put so that love uh, and oh Lord help me and you didn't even know God was helping you and God was moving you and moving the pieces and training you and you never even realized it so God has brought you here today to tell you that I ordained it from the beginning I had the script in my hand I had the script in my hand and there ain't nothing that I'm speaking to you. When, when God rebukes you, it's just to move you back. That's why, that's why David said, Thy rod and thy staff comfort me. Because what your rod and your staff do, it just puts me back in line into the line of my destiny and my purpose. That's why it comforts me because it lets me know that I'm not too far away from my purpose That you can't just hit me a little bit and push me back in Because if I was too far away, you would have to knock my head south sideways But I know that your ride is a comfort to me Because number one, it tells me you still love me You still connected to me You still worried about me You're not just, just throwing me to the side
side and say, I don't care what happens with you. Just go ahead and get lost. Go ahead and lose your destiny. No, no, you're always correcting me and pushing me back in. So he speaks to Jeremiah and he says, and he tells him, you know, he, he tells him, you know, don't say that you're a child. And he says, don't be afraid of the faces and, 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 and just do what God has called you. I'm going to anoint you. And, and Jeremiah, it gets convinced by God and, and, and he understands that I was ordained from the beginning and, and God had this thing and he had me from the beginning. So if God knew me from my belly, then he must know me now. So if he knows me now, then he knows where I'm going. So I'd rather go with somebody that knows where I'm going than just stay with me where I don't know where I need to go or where I'm going. So God just use me and just take my life. So he goes and, and, and he takes his life and, and then all of a sudden God he has this encounter, this beautiful encounter with God where he's having a people, he's having a conversation with God. God is talking to him. You understand how beautiful he's talking to God. Like you and me are talking, right? He's talking to God. So God draws him into his destiny that he's been chosen from the beginning. But as we read, then, you know, other people might say it was all downhill from there. Because if there was ever a prophet that went through pain, it was Jeremiah. To the point that they call him the crying prophet. Because the pain and the suffering and throwing in jail and, and, and being treated like garbage and, 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 and nobody listening and, and, and nobody following him and, and, and nobody, nobody, he had the word and he knew it was God and he would deliver it and deliver it with love and, and, and with anxiousness and with, and, and, with, and with severity. But always, always letting them know that God still loves you. And, and Jeremiah's message always was, was always a judgment, but there was always redemption with it. There was always, but just fix yourself and none of this will happen. If you just, just do what God said. None of this will happen. And, and, and it was almost like God would give him a revelation. But his heart was so, he, was, he had so much love in his heart that he would just have to almost like, not add to it, but he would have to reveal the heart of God that he knew. And God would give him the man and say, but listen, if you would just repent. If you would just repent. None of this, none of this. I'm saying God will save you. But they wouldn't listen. So then we jump. Just give me 10 more minutes. And we, he jumped, we jumped to, to chapter 20. And, and after, after 19 chapters of pain and suffering and nobody listening. And, and nobody, listen. It's powerful when God talks to you. It's powerful when God talks to you. And how many know that it becomes more and more difficult when what God spoke to you, you don't see the results with your eyes. That God gives you a word. We see it. When, when, when God gives you a word here and you take it, you feel the glory of God. You feel the confirmation of what God is saying. You go home the first and second day and you feel it. Oh, but that third and fourth day, when they, you know, things go back to normal and you're still dealing with the everyday things and you're like, God, oh, but spoke into my life but I can't see it happening. I don't see it with my eyes and I'm trying to do everything you're telling me to do and it's easy the first week but what about the second week? What about when this happens? What about when I can't pay this? And what about when I fight with her? And, and what about when, when my friends turn their back? And, and what about when, when I don't feel your anointing? What about when I can't pray like I was praying last week? What about when I read the word and I can't understand what it's saying? What do I do when I I find myself in this place where God I still and, 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 and it's funny because the word begins to almost dim away it begins to feel very far away to the point that sometimes you can't even quote what God spoke to you because life becomes so difficult and becomes so wearing down that you start to think about that word and it's almost like a blur yet God says something about me singing or something like that he said that I'll preach anointing, jumping countries, and something like that. But when God said it, you could have quoted it for the first three or four days. So now we see Jeremiah in this place. And now he tells God. And he said, Oh, Jesus. Verse 8. For since I spake, I cried out. I cried violence and spoil because the word of the Lord was made reproach to me. 
and derision daily. Jeremiah is telling God, God, I've been speaking the word that you gave me, but I can't speak the word anymore. I can't profess what I felt 20 chapters ago. I know I had an encounter with you, but now where I am right now, I can't tap into that. I can't touch it. And he says, because your word has become reproach. Reproach means rebuke. <laughs> Your word has become rebuke to me. But it does not feel anymore like a rebuke to get me somewhere. It feels like you're just, he, he's basically, he's telling God, God, I feel like I'm just your, your toy. I'm your hobby now. I feel like now you're just doing things to entertain yourself now. I'm your movie of the night. You, you, I feel that your word is just rebuke. And it's not taking me, it's just, um, it, it, and it's not simply rebuke, it's a reproach. It's, a, it's, it's, it's when somebody uh, doesn't give you value. It's a rebuke with, without value. It's a rebuke like, you know what, you ain't nothing, get away, you're wrong, and that's it, I don't want to deal with you. It's a, it's a disconnect rebuke. He's saying, you're rebuking me, but you're repro it's a reproach, you're, you're, you're putting me to the side. I did what you're telling me. I know somebody feel like that up in here. I, I'm doing what you're telling me. I thought I was doing it right. But now I feel like your word is not comforting anymore. It is a reproach. It is pushing me away. Rather than your word push me to you, it's making me feel less worthy of you. And because it's making me feel less worthy, I'm pushing away from you, God. I can't pray anymore. I don't feel worthy. I don't feel because now the rebuke, I don't feel that it's to push me towards you. It's to push me away from you. And I'm coming to church, but I don't know how long I can do this. I'm coming to church, but I don't know how long I can come to church. I'm praying a little bit, but I don't know how much I can do this. Lord, because I just, I, I, I'm about to just throw it down and I'm done. Because if I'm going to do this, I want to do this all the way. I don't want to do this halfway, God. And I don't want to play with you, God. So it's starting to become, and then it says derision. And derision means mocking. So he tells God, your word now is becoming mock to me. Have you ever been in a place, or are you in that place right now, that the word feels like it's mocking you? What do I mean by that? That you feel like when you read the word, it's almost, this cannot be for me. Because if God really knew me, okay, then he will know that I cannot do that. You know my God, I cannot be what this verse is telling me to be. So God, why would you call me to you to then give me a word that I can't even live? Because it speaks against everything that I am and that you and if you and then you say God, so if you knew me, because that's where the where that's where I, where, where, where the theme comes from. Do I know you? Because we feel like we are in a place where you are questioning if God really knows you. Because if he really knew me, he would never ask me to do that or do it that way. Because I can not and do not have the ability to be who God is saying for me to be. I can't do what the preacher is saying. I can't live what the preacher is saying. I can't talk like the preacher saying or talk. That's never been me. It will never be me. So I don't know what he's talking about. And then you, and then we give it, we give it the what I call the fake try. You know what I mean? It's like uh, whoever um your parent ever asked you to do something that you really didn't want to do. And then you do it, but you do it in a bad way to prove to her that you couldn't do it in the first place. 
My kids do it all the time. I love that, but y'all do it all the time. I'll go and I'll say, for example, I'll tell them, you know, uh, I'll tell LG. LG is, I love him, but LG. LG, wash the dishes. Daddy, I don't know how to wash dishes. What? Wash the dish. You know what he'll do? He'll put either a lot of soap on the thing or not put enough soap, right? And he'll wipe it one time and leave soap on the plate. And to show me that he can't do it. <laughs> so, he says, see that? I don't know how to do it. Told you. I told you. I tried. I tried to wash the plate. But look, I leave soap on the plate. So, you see, you should have not asked me to do it. Because now I'm in trouble with mom. Because she's screaming at me. Because she took the plate to feed Micah. And now the, the plate has soap in it. And then now Micah's going to get sick. So, you see? <laughs> Are we not like that with God? Are we not like that with God? God do this and we do give it a fake try like I'm gonna try you see God I told you I told you I couldn't be who you told me I tried to do it as long but then that person came and talked to me and got me all mad and I told you that I couldn't do it I tried to do it for long enough you see and I held on and then somebody else came and got me mad and somebody else came and I did it long enough so now look at what happened so you see I told you I couldn't be that so leave me alone let me be who I am now because I can't be who you tell me so why did I read the first verse? Because you're arguing with somebody that knows you better than yourself. Wow. You're arguing, he is arguing with God about who he thinks that he can be and what he has done and tired of doing and can't be anymore. With somebody that I had already declared to him that I knew you before you were even born. I knew who you were before. The issue with us is, is like the thing says, do I know you? This is what I want you to do right now. Because the theme wasn't for you to tell the person next to you. And it wasn't for God to tell it to you. It was for you to point at yourself and say, do I know you? at hand is not if God knows you because he does. The question is do you know yourself? Not what experience has made you. Not who you thought you had to be to survive in the streets. Not who you thought you need to be in order to survive in your home. Not who you think you need to be because of everything you've been through. No. Who are you? Do you know who you are? Do you know yourself? Do you know yourself? And that is the question that now Jeremiah is presented with because he's telling God, and he tells him in verse 9, he says, and I'm almost done, five minutes. He says, then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak anymore in his name. I will not speak anymore in his name. I will not because your word now to me because your word now to me feels like it's mocking me and presenting to me something that I can never reach your word is presenting to me a lifestyle or a thing to reach that is not for me then I'm not going to speak about you anymore I am not going to declare you anymore. Because instinctively what we do is that when we get to this place of saying I'm not going to keep fighting to get to here. We have to hit the shut off button on the Holy Ghost. We have to shut the button off on the Holy Ghost. Because we cannot deal with the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And those who think that conviction of the Holy Ghost is only to tell you when you do something wrong and he tells you, oh, don't do that. It's not, 
only conviction. That's not the only job of the conviction. Conviction of the Holy Ghost is to push you to who God says that you're supposed to be. So, see, the struggle is not because we can't get, we, as a matter of fact, that's when we turn it on. Because we don't want to pull so far away that we become this flesh person that we can't recognize. So, we, we turn the switch of the Holy Ghost on when we do wrong. Because when we do wrong, we feel like now I'm really getting pushed away from God. I'm falling off the mountain. So I need to turn the switch back on. Because if I don't, I'm going to completely disconnect from God. But we shut it off when the Holy Ghost wants to tell us you're not who you're acting like you are. You are not walking like you're supposed to be. You are not talking like the person that you're supposed to be. So that's where we got to shut it off. Because we can't deal with the Holy Ghost telling us that you cannot be the way that you're acting right now. Because we identify conviction with simply sitting and failing God through sin. And we cannot understand that right now in this picture, Jeremiah didn't sin. He didn't go and fornicate. He didn't go adultery. He didn't go as a matter of fact. He was doing the opposite. He was walking in what God told him to walk. But this is the question. This is the question. Are you doing what God told you to do? Or are you being who God told you to be? Say that again. Are you simply doing what God told you to do? Or are you being who God told you to be? Because I can tell Bam Bam to do pastor stuff. But only he can become a pastor. Only he can operate in those things with a spirit of pastorship. So when God tells you to do something, are you simply doing it or are you allowing it to become part of who you are? Are you simply stopping from watching something or are you going to turn into somebody that's holy? Are you simply going to do and go minister to somebody or are you going to become a minister and bring the word? It's about, in this picture, in one minute, God is telling him, right now, I need to explain something to you. For 20 chapters, you've been doing what I told you to do. Now, I want you to be who I told you to be. Amen. Jeremiah now realizes by himself that I thought I was doing something, but I wasn't doing stuff. I was becoming somebody. I was becoming who God told me to be. How do I know this? Because his mouth says, I will not mention you. But the verse then says, but his word was in my heart as a burning of fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing and I could not I'm done. Stand up on your feet.